So does serendipity play a role in research? Um, when you're doing research, when you're looking for discoveries, you're actually looking for the unexpected. So in fact, research is only successful when something happens that you didn't really expect to happen. It isn't the conclusion uh, always that's the most exciting thing, but it's confusion. In many cases, it's just some funny thing in your apparatus or somebody was jumping up and down in the next room. But every once in a while, it's real. And when it's real, it can be really important. Well, it's usually defined as some accidental discovery. That's the common notion of serendipity. However, it all depends on how you understand accident, because if accident is sort of equated with chaos or with complete unpredictability, that's probably not correct. There's a number of things that, that push towards serendipity. Persistence is one of the key things to success in science. So when you get something that you don't expect, and you have to follow it up, and you have to keep pushing, it's like Sherlock Holmes, you rule out every other possibility, and there it is, you know, you, you've got it. Just the act of looking means that you, know, you start turning over rocks and you, know, you discover things. You see things. You don't necessarily know what you see. You don't understand it, you can't make sense of it. We've been studying complex formation between charged polymers. They form a new liquid phase. This is sometimes called a coacervate. Uh, we were mixing materials like this, and instead of getting the liquid phase that we expected, we got a solid phase. That is, the thing turned into a rock. And we didn't expect that, and it didn't have, initially we were disappointed because it didn't have the interesting properties that we were used to studying. But we've now figured out a whole different way to use this solid phase complexation to build new materials. So in a mission-driven lab like Argon, you know, we have big problems. And to get to the root of those big problems, you try doing very bold things. There are you know, grand challenges that we're trying to do either in batteries or, or the world's fastest computer. But the challenge of doing that, it's so hard that you set yourself a set of goals and those goals drive you forward and they drive you as much into science as they do into technology. But in the end, it's what nature gives you. And nature gives you a certain thing and you have to be able to measure that thing. You have to measure the details of, for us, particle interactions. So if you're careful about how you build your detectors and understand how to build them in a way that makes their reach as large as possible, then you increase the chances that you might be a little bit more lucky. Language can play a role. Like someone talks about something completely different but uses a notion. I related it to what was intuitively in my mind, my own problem, and it solved it. You want a system, you want a process to reduce the need for the luck. Luck is great, but you don't want to depend upon it. Well, there's a direct connection between the scientific innovation and the business innovation. They're really doing the same thing. If you look, for instance, at new product development, or do I enter a new market? Very similar to a scientific problem, just not stated in the same way. I've got to figure this out. What's going on? Here are all the factors. The terminology may be different, but the process of going through it is just amazingly parallel. As the scale of science changes, the level at which risks are allowed, the level at which luck becomes a factor, tends to go down. Lack of imagination is a barrier, too. You have to be pushing the envelope a little bit. Our imaginations are always, to some extent, limitations on what we can explore. Scientists tend to be both obsessed but also modest because they get hit over the head constantly. It doesn't work to be arrogant because the, the object world constantly tells you, no, no, I don't want to do that, no, I do something else, you know. So there's both anti-serendipity and serendipity too because if something that's supposed to be obvious doesn't happen, it doesn't happen for a very good reason. 
One thing that's very uh, interesting and challenging as a professor is how to uh, get students alert to serendipity. There's a sort of a hump you have to get over between being an undergraduate student and being a professional scientist that doesn't make you so sure that you know what the right results are and that you can really see new stuff when it actually happens. We don't know everything and and sometimes when you do get results that are not conventional wisdom, you really have to rethink the conventional wisdom. Serendipity is not a process that can be contained in one moment. Usually the moment is a stimulus, is something that an incentive to look at something more concretely. But then, of course, it does allow you to go in a different direction. And a lot of it is actually having you know, the belief, right, that this will be important and therefore I'm going to go and study it. The best kind of research is actually the search for serendipity. I mean, I think what Pasteur called how chance favors the prepared mind.